Hello, I'm Ari. And I'm Claudine. Welcome to Proving the Negative. We're a podcast all about exploring the different sides of cybersecurity, from political science to computer science, international relations to mathematics. Join us as we talk to our friends about the work they do. Today, we're going to be talking about how hate groups operate online, specifically how they use social media platforms to coordinate their efforts or spread their ideologies. It's a topic for governments, it's a topic for the public, and it's of interest, of course, to law enforcement. Yeah, I mean, the way online platforms were used to coordinate the January 6th attacks on the Capitol, organized groups can extensively use social media to coordinate offline actions. Those coordinated actions can slip under the radar. So it's it's a topic that I'm keen to learn more about. My name is Fatima. I am a doctoral student at the University of Oxford in cybersecurity. My research is kind of looking into online hate and how it's used across multiple platforms. Your elevator pitch, what would that sound like? We've seen over the past couple of decades how online platforms and social media has become an increasingly integral part of communication today. And this has especially been highlighted during the ongoing COVID pandemic. But this has, of course, had an impact on how malicious actors communicate as well. So one example of this is extremist and hate groups making use of these platforms to spread their propaganda, recruit individuals, or just forming more stronger networks with like-minded people. And we've seen how this behavior can lead to catastrophic events like the ISIS Paris attacks and the Christchurch mosque attack. So this isn't just a, a problem for the online community. This is something that has a huge impact on the, off, uh, on the offline world as well. So this isn't a problem faced just by specific platforms, but it's something that's faced by a majority of online platforms today. And oftentimes hate groups will make use of multiple platforms, um, no matter their audience size. So my research kind of argues that we can't just look at online hate from from the perspective of a single platform when exploring this. And so it looks into how we can use a cross-platform perspective to look at online hate to see if we can gain any insight into how platforms are used differently and whether we can map hateful behavior across multiple platforms so we have a more organized approach to countering it. Very, very cool. Could you clarify what you mean by a malicious actor? Yeah, so um, in my case, what I am considering a malicious actor, I'm looking at more um, hate groups that have been identified by um, law enforcement agencies or um, people who have identified in some way that they are supporters of hateful ideology that has also been identified by law enforcement agencies. But that's what I'm considering as malicious actors, but there's various other malicious actors that use social media. So what other kind of malicious actors do we have out there? Now they're not even just humans. You have bots as well who are propagating all kinds of stuff, um, whether it's trying to influence the opinion of audience, um, the online audience, or whether it's just trying to get people to engage in certain activities online in which you can get information from them so like we kind of saw this with Cambridge Analytica a little bit I mean it wasn't so much uh, so much malicious as it was uh, intrusive and kind of exploiting things that online platforms provide that we weren't really brought to attention to the general public before so yeah it's just it's changing all the time this definition of malicious actors and how they make use of these platforms. The work that you do the end result or or something you want to do by the end of it is have this unified approach. Different platforms have one problem in common and particularly the problem you look at. So my question is, why do we have to work together on this or who needs to work together on this? Yeah, so it's not so much that we need to have one unified approach. It's more, we haven't looked at how multiple platforms are used in this space anyway. Research has just been like, So this is what's going on in Twitter during this year, during this month. And so that means this is how hate is going to be. And this is how we need to address online hate. But then that's specific to Twitter. So we can't apply that to multiple platforms. We need to start looking at all platforms and seeing, is there a way in which they're different in how how hate groups make use of their platforms? Do they use them for different things? Are they used together in some way? Like is some 
stuff posted on one platform and then other stuff is posted on another platform maybe because the rules on one platform are more lax than another a unifying response that wouldn't really work considering how different each platform is it's more that we haven't looked at the perspectives of different platforms and so we haven't included that in the counter approaches that we're looking at right now. I realize it's a, it's a work in progress but what have you found so far in terms of looking at that taking that more global perspective of multiple platforms? I have seen differences in how platforms are used so um, it can be really very sort of I was looking at online hate during the US elections I was looking at how hate groups posting on different platforms during this time. In particular, I was looking at 4chan and Reddit, and we found that Reddit had a much more organized response during the actual election in terms of posting links for fundraising, or whether it was hate groups or just like for um, Trump supporting causes. They were just, there was just a lot of repeat posting of URL links, but 4chan was a lot more discussing how the results and not as much of an organized approach but um so yeah it's very interesting to see how different communities how they can be used differently that was one thing that i found so far two-part question the first thing is could you just clarify quickly what a a hate group is and then i'll ask my follow-up question hate groups have a different definition across different you know areas jurisdiction countries So each kind of law enforcement agency will have their own definition of a hate group. Generally, it's when you're going against the social norms that are acceptable within your within your country, because each country also has laws. And so some a lot of the time it's specific to the country that you're in. Um, And this is applicable to social media as well. So you've seen how um, even though social media platforms generally have their own body that will uh, monitor content that's online, each country also has their rules, which social media platforms have to follow. And so similarly, uh, hate groups are going against what is socially acceptable behavior. They say things that mean that certain groups of people have a worse time, bad things, people being mistreated. And that's sort of a tangible result that so we don't want hate groups because that means that people will suffer in real life from an online forum to the real world this becomes a real world harm that these ideas being passed around in online forums these things are bad because people are impacted it's not a, a data problem entirely it's from these discussions comes real world harm is this a fair assessment of why hate groups are undesirable exactly it's um it's why most countries now have have listed online hate as an online harm, even though it is a grey area in terms of like defining and having one unified response everywhere and one unified definition of hate across all countries and languages and stuff. It's universally agreed that hate groups cause harm online and will have some kind of consequence offline as well. I have one more thing I'd like to to jump in with. You saw a more organized response from these groups on certain Mm -hmm. platforms than on others. I'm curious if you've seen change in the relationship between hate groups and the platforms that they use, if platforms respond to those to those new and emerging, to those threats that are posed by by hate groups by reinforcing their standards. And if so, how does that affect the way those hate groups use social media platforms and which social media platforms they use? So this is something that's like a huge area of research going on in this particular topic. The main example that can be used is during the ISIS's prime on Twitter, which was like, uh, during like 2014 to 2016. And we saw a lot of pro-ISIS support that was being posted on Twitter. But after a lot of a lot of the attacks that were happening offline, in particular the Paris attacks, Twitter took a stand and started suspending multiple accounts. So at first it was almost becoming like a a badge of honor to these pro ISIS supporters where they'd say, where they'd create new accounts and be like, oh, I got suspended this many times before. So it was almost like they'd been doing more to fight for their cause. But uh, of course, this ha- meant that eventually they were kicked off the platform. And so they had to move to different platforms to kind of spread their more extremist content. So we saw them move to more encrypted platforms like Telegram, which, of course, it's like, you know, they champion themselves as 
providing encrypted communication and all your communication isn't going to be accessible to law enforcement no one's going to publish it it's only going to stick within your own groups so we see a lot of this platform migration a lot in this space even with just over the last year so during the US elections and during the BLM resurgence that we had last summer we saw that there was a lot more hate on reddit communities and then they were eventually banned by reddit because they were increasing the hateful content we see this platform migration all the time the thing is we any time one of these platforms is suspended then they move to another platform there's always another platform to move to right and that platform will have more lax rules and then eventually pressure mounts on them to have more monitoring on their content and to moderate whatever's being posted there but then what happens is that you will get platforms that have a lot more reach which are the ones which have more rules and more moderation and then you'll have platforms um that have less reach but they'll have more lax rules so the um, a lot of these platforms are used together so you're still recruiting people but not posting as much extremist or hateful explicit content on the mainstream sites it's not even misusing them because they're being used in the way that they've been intended to be used as social media mm-hmm. but then it's whether you you police or censor free speech it's not freedom from consequence though this is a huge thing especially most of these kind of platforms that have the more lax rules they their main uh, ethos is just like we're providing freedom of speech this is a platform for freedom of speech so we won't be monitoring we won't have as many rules but even there you'll see that they're used by particular types of hate groups and not others which is also like a really interesting question so for example you have gab and that kind of rose to prominence because especially following trump's election a lot of content was being posted on twitter had become uh identified as hate and so this other platform was saying oh we won't have any rules here so they're used more by trump supporting white supremacist type hate but you won't find as many isis supporters there which is really which is also like an interesting part of this mostly it's under the control of platform providers so twitter will have their own set of rules allowed on our platform but this is goes against what um our platform is about and so a lot of the time this will just be suspended or deleted it's mainly just the platform providers especially when it comes to removing content it's only the platform providers that really have control over it there can be pressure put on them by governments and uh, even the pub- general public if there's enough of a response it's just so big in terms of perspective there's like countless platforms there's countless hate groups and stuff Uh, I just had to kind of narrow down my scope a little so I was looking at this from a specific use case just so we'd get an idea and then identifying hate groups or hate ideologies that are present across multiple platforms and that we can that would help narrow down the platforms we include in the analysis and also the kind of hate ideologies what have you found to be the most sort of ex- surprising or unexpected thing that you've come across a, a lot of this stuff was hypothesis in my head and so i didn't really know whether there would be a difference between how each platform was used seeing how each of these platforms has their own audience and their own type of content so you'll have um when i was looking at 4chan and reddit i saw there was a lot more explicit content on 4chan and so people weren't afraid to link pictures or uh, graphics and stuff and then but the approach on reddit was a lot more specific and that's also because reddit has more rules and fortune does in terms of moderating and so that could have had an impact on you know we don't want to get kicked off this platform so we have to stick by the rules on fortune it's like it's way less organized it's just everything was um you could post anything and there were a lot more agreements and disagreements if you had all the resources and you had all the money in the world what big question would you explore for this particular area of research i think the main thing is like how i was saying there's so many platforms online and there's so many hate groups and again hate is posted in loads of different languages and loads of different cultures and it there's so many definitions and stuff so it would be really in, but there hasn't been a lot of comparison in this area so whether it's like comparing hateful content in one language to english because mo- uh, most research in this area is kind of just focusing on english hate but we haven't had a lot of comparison across different countries different languages different cultures different platforms and i think this is something that we really need to do to get 
a better understanding of how it operates online and so if i had like an unlimited amount of time and money then i would just probably be able to make use of look at hate from different languages and then seeing how it compares and whether there's like a cause for concern um in other countries as well whether that has an impact on online hate in other places so like uh, especially how we saw with ISIS attacks a lot of the time it was organized in arabic right but then um you'd see the actual attacks happening in non arabic speaking countries is there a word we can use instead of hate so this is interesting because even when i was starting in this research i was focusing more on extremism and extremist groups so um, what i had found through that was there were less groups that were being used by law enforcement under this particular term so they um they would have a list of hate groups because i guess for them a lot of the time extremist groups are mainly hate groups that have been linked to attacks offline and so there's there's a definite kind of impact there's a definite impact from the online and offline so for example isis is clearly a uh, an extremist group right and then you have individual extremists like uh, the christchurch shooter who isn't operating under a group but he was he's still very much an extremist and so then what i found was this christchurch shooter he only became an extremist after he did the attack right he wasn't he wouldn't have been considered as an extremist while he was posting online it would have just been online hate yeah because he was attacking certain groups of people but um, it wouldn't have been extremism per se so the reason i kind of went towards hate in my research is because it was a slightly broader um it had a slightly broader definition than something specific like extremism and i think currently with how legislation across multiple different countries are being proposed hate is what is generally used so you'll find more resources or more information on the type of groups or ideologies that are counted as hate i'm curious having looked at a lot of these different uh groups in depth if you've noticed any um overarching similarities between different hate groups obviously not in terms of ideology necessarily but in terms of the approaches that they use either to um uh, market themselves online or to recruit or to organize or or all three a lot of the time i found that there just wasn't enough content for me to compare across say one particular hate group that was on twitter and gab um and then this other hate group that was on twitter and reddit but then i couldn't compare across all three platforms or what or whatever i tended to just group my hate groups into one overarching hate ideology and compare them across multiple platforms like that that being said i did have while i was doing my research say one hate group is like uh, propagating their hate through selling certain merchandise like t-shirts or music or what have you then this would be promoted by other hate groups saying this is a link to these t-shirts that you can buy to prom- help our cause so there was like some collaboration between them i didn't look at them specifically because it wasn't part of my like research questions but it's something that i found that was like quite interesting but also like yeah it, it just makes this whole thing quite um you know is this one hate group is this two hate groups because they have different names and different organizational bodies and different like websites but there was just a lot overlap between them online many people will celebrate across the group so there are so whether it's politicians that are very radically right or, or um certain uh or just like certain public figures a lot of the time it's like almost public figures who have come to light in some way in this area and so they're celebrated across each of these groups as like some kind of idol even if that person would have their own group um there so there's a lot of like overlap between them let's talk more about you you're doing amazing work so day to day what are the frustrations or what are the things you really enjoy about the the work that you do i think it's the one space where i'm constantly learning and i don't know if i would get as much in another environment one thing that i found difficult was just finding an area where um i could provide some novel insight that's something that i personally struggled with and just because there's so much research going on and i think when you actually start your phd you realize wow there's so much research going on how do i find a gap here so that's one thing that i found difficult but and i think oftentimes 
you don't realize how long it can take just to identify that gap because it can take from like you know the better part of a year just to find this novel area of space that you can work in uh, in addition to that I would say have this one cohesive research question that you're constantly answering no matter what kind of um, analysis that you're doing that can also be a little difficult in your research but once you have these clearly outlined and um, it, it becomes so interesting and then you start enjoying the whole process of actually learning from your analysis more but yeah it's um, of course there's going to be frustrating days and there are days where like I can't uh, when nothing's working. What are you working on now? So I'm working on one other research project which came as a result of a summer school that I attended. This is a group project with different researchers across the UK and Europe and we're looking at we're using similar methods of like text analysis and social media analysis where we're looking at how sentiment across online communities changes during these so-called crypto hypes, which for people who don't know is when the cryptocurrency values rise and fall. And so, yeah, we're looking at these specific online crypto communities where this stuff is discussed all the time, whether there's more of a community aspect involved when the prices change and stuff like that so yeah there's just a lot of it's not specifically feelings but it's just more the overall group opinion and how they change this project is still in its infancy because it's just a few weeks old but we did find quite a few interesting findings one example is that we found when the prices of um the we're looking at bitcoin specifically but when the prices of bitcoin increase then the online communities become a little bit more individual and independent in terms of how users will post. So they will talk about, I bought this stock in Bitcoin or I sold this stock in Bitcoin. What I want to do next is look at how these platforms are used within networks of hate and how activity maps across platforms and how we can form, whether there's any, whether there is larger um, network of hate that encompasses multiple platforms and stuff so um, it's something that I haven't done before but hopefully I'll be able to get something out of it so yeah it's more using network analysis approaches. If people are interested in learning more about the topic in that research area what kind of um, resources would you suggest that they look at? There's this conference called ICWSM which is general research in the social media online platform space so there's a lot of research going on across loads of different topics not just like online hate it's from like like everything from like just looking at how even with the pandemic looking at you know the sentiment around vaccinations and what have you so there's whether you're looking at online hate or not this conference in particular will have a lot of the methods that would be applicable to your research area so this is like a resource that I found really useful it also publishes data sets whether it's on the covid pandemic hateful platforms loads of different types of data sets as well that are really useful uh, a really useful resource for this type of research research project Voxpol they have a lot of ideas and a lot of articles published all the time whether it's fully fledged research publications or just articles a hypothesis of this we've seen this happening so that, um, that's been a really interesting starting point to just look at online hate specifically with how much technology and how much online resources that we're using in our day-to-day -day lives home or work or what have you realizing how these can be misused and how to use these technologies in the proper way my understanding of cybersecurity right now it's such a broad area and I think that especially when I joined this program I found way more definitions of cybersecurity than I had anticipated. That was our interview with Fatima. Join us next week for another fascinating conversation. In the meantime you can tweet at us at hellopntpod and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. The title there is PTN Pod. See you next week. Bye. This has been a podcast from the Center for Doctoral Training in Cybersecurity at the University of Oxford, funded by the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council.